diplomacy, they call this a grin and grab. In last night's presidential debate, it quickly gave way to grimaces as both candidates exchanged blows. Donald Trump started the brighter, attacking Hillary Clinton for initially backing the Pacific trade deal that he said would cost America jobs. You called it the gold standard of trade and deals. You, you know said what? it's the finest deal you've ever seen. No. And then you heard what I said about it, and all of a sudden you were against it. Well, Donald, I know you live in your own reality, but oh, yeah. that is not... The facts, the facts but then it was I Donald Trump's turn to be put under the cosh, first over his refusal to hand over his tax returns, something that all candidates have done for over 40 years. Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes, because the only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. Paid but how smart when everyone else has to pay tax? His business acumen is a cornerstone of his appeal. Not releasing those returns only raises more questions. He then came under attack over his attitude towards women, a key demographic in this election where he's trailing badly. But this is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. She and spoke about a beauty pageant contestant who Mr. Trump had called Miss Housekeeping because she was, because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is did Alicia you find this? Machado. Where did you find And it? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. Let me just tell you. But Donald Trump then sought to make it about character. Who had the stamina to be president? Uh, she doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. And I don't believe she does have the stamina. To be president of this country, you need tremendous stamina. Well, as soon as he travels to 112 countries and negotiates a peace deal, a ceasefire, a release of dissidents, an opening of new... Uh, opportunities in nations around the world, or even spends 11 hours testifying in front of uh, a congressional committee. He can talk to me about stamina. Hillary has experience, but it's bad experience. We have made so many bad deals during the last... Uh, so she's got experience, that I agree, but it's bad, bad experience. Donald Whether Trump positioning himself as the political so outsider resonates with many disillusioned Americans. Back. But the end of the debate it was Donald Trump's stamina that seemed to be flagging. Here in the spin room, both sides are claiming victory, as you'd expect, and Donald Trump has come in to do his own spinning. He had one question to answer in this debate. Did he have the temperament to be the next commander-in-chief, the next president? And on that, maybe the jury is still out. Mr Trump, are you satisfied with how it went? John Sopel, BBC News, Hofstra University, New York. So what was the verdict? Several news organisations carried out their own polls with widely differing results. A joint CNN-ORC survey gave Mrs Clinton 62% and Donald Trump 27%. But the organisations acknowledged that more Democrats than Republicans took part. Uh, the broadcaster CNBC asked people to cast their votes on its website. The outcome there, 61 to 39 in favour of Mr Trump. Although there's no way of knowing the background of any of the people who took part in that. Uh, the public policy polling organisation carried out its own survey of what it claims is a balanced group of more than a thousand registered US voters. They called it 51 to 40 for Hillary, with 9% uh, of people undecided. Well, Pennsylvania is a key swing state for both candidates. What do voters there think about how it went? Our correspondent, Regini Vaidyanathan, is there too. Regini, what's the verdict? Well, I've spent the morning here at Philadelphia's Reading Terminal Market. People are just finishing off their lunch now, but throughout the course of the morning, people have been digesting and discussing last night's debate. And as you say, Pennsylvania, a key state this election. It is a key battleground. It's where both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump really need to win if they want the keys to the White House. So what do voters here think? Well, I'm joined by two, Jim and Dorothy. Thanks for joining us both on BBC News. Let's start with you, Jim. What did you think of last night's debate? I was uh, disappointed to some degree. I thought that the moderator behaved and conducted himself somewhat like a, 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 a uh, rookie. I say that for two reasons. One is he always started the questioning with the same candidate except one time. 
and I think that that gave an advantage to, the, to that candidate. getting Hillary Clinton, you mean? Pardon? You mean Hillary Clinton? Yes, that was Hillary. Um, and she started the answers ex except on the second to last question. And that gave her an advantage of getting her ideas out in the, in the brains of the audience and, and people first. And then Mr. Trump had to say things that would try to get those ideas away from them. So you're supporting Donald Trump? I, su I support Donald Trump. How would you assess his overall performance last night then? How do you think he did overall? I think they both did okay. I don't think either of them really gained any votes or lost any votes. I think they both did pretty well. Okay, let's bring Dorothy in. Dorothy, you're a Hillary Clinton supporter. How do you think your candidate did? I think she did well. I think her experience showed. I think she's done these so many times for so many years that she knows how they work and knows how to make the best advantage of the situation she was in. I think she did fine. I don't, also don't think that they either one would have gained or lost any supporters. I think a debate is a difficult thing for someone to change someone's mind because it's so difficult of a situation for them to be in. How much of this is now just kind of box office reality TV and how much of this is really about important political issues do you think? I think um, a lot of it is just reality TV. A lot of it is trying to get voters attention, um, applying their base instinct. Um, I don't think I am a Hillary supporter and I personally don't think Donald Trump has a lot of actual real ideas. I don't think his policies are fully formed. I think Hillary Clinton has a lot more experience in those areas and I really just think it's a matter of a personality complex. You know, at one point or another people are just going to gravitate to the personality they like the best for better or worse. And Jim, just finally, what do you think Donald Trump needs to do before the next debate? Well, I think he needs to stick to his uh, solutions to the problems in America. I think he's got that figured out pretty well. He doesn't think like a politician and he doesn't talk like a politician. And I don't know how to <laughs> tell him to change or, or to improve on that. An example, last night Hillary talked uh, to Mr. Trump about his financials. And she brought up um, um, 15 or so points about his financials. All of them were based on speculation. Now, she worded it in such a way that if a person wasn't playing close, paying close attention, they'd think that she was making factual statements. Okay, let's just quickly bring Dorothy in on that point. Um, I agree that Donald Trump doesn't talk or act like a politician. I think he might be better served to maybe do that a little bit more, a little of his... Um, kind of more grander and more controversial statements, I think, alienate a lot of people. And I think he definitely, if he wants to get enough support, he definitely needs to stop alienating people, but in a way that seems valid, not that he's just saying what we want him to say, that he really means it. And I don't know if he really has time to do that. Okay, well, Dorothy and Jim, some very interesting views there here in Philadelphia. It is, of course, worth noting that that was the first of three presidential debates, and there's also a vice presidential debate next week. So there's still a lot of time for many of the undecided voters who I've met through the course of the morning to make up their minds. Regini, thanks very much. Regini Vaidyanathan there in Philadelphia. There was a lot of talk at the debate about trade. Uh, Donald Trump had some things to say about that. Uh, and joining me from Washington, a uh, political risk analyst, Tobias Harris. Tobias Harris, welcome to the programme. I mean, did you get much of a picture uh, of the kind of America that we would see under each candidate last night from that debate about how they deal with the rest of the world when it comes to trade? So I think maybe not so much with trade in particular, but certainly in, ter in terms of how they approach the rest of the world. I mean, from Donald Trump, we got the exact same message, really, he's been saying for 30 years. And that is U.S. allies are taking advantage of the United States. The U.S. is underfooting the bill for, th for their security, allowing them to get rich and allowing them to take advantage of U.S. economic openness through trade deals. And, and that has to stop. I mean, that has been his worldview. He's been consistent about it. And from Secretary Clinton, it's a little different uh, what we're getting from her. I mean, obviously, she said that she does not support the Trans-Pacific Partnership anymore, but I think she does have a worldview that recognizes the value of the institutions the United States created at the end of World War II in 1945. Maybe they need some updating, but she recognizes that there are positive sum gains from the U.S. underwriting some of these, these global institutions, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, and so on, and that that has to continue and that there's value in that continuing.
the Donald Trump going on the attack over, over Hillary Clinton's reversal on that uh, trade deal, the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, how much of a blow do you think he landed there? Because that was seen as one of, the, one of his strongest elements in, in last night. I mean, it's certainly, I think, an issue where Secretary Clinton is vulnerable. I mean, obviously, people on her left, uh, uh, former su or supporters of uh, Senator Sanders from the Democratic primary campaign, I think TPP was a big issue for them. And so it's something where I think there's a lot of questions over where does she actually stand on this? What will she actually do? And I think even you know, wherever her heart is, I think because of that, I think if she were elected, it'd be very hard for her to move forward with the trade agreement, even though it's something that President Obama, I think, is 100 percent trying to get done before he leaves office, even though there are a lot of obstacles in the way of that. Do you do you think that there is any perception that Donald Trump is more trustworthy with matters of trade, given that he is a product of the business world and not a politician? So I don't know if, I don't know if trust really really gets there. I mean, this is someone who I think back in 2000, he talked about how he was going to, uh, if he were elected as the Reform Party candidate, he talked about running for president in 2000 that year, and he was going to be his own trade representative. So this is someone who's talked a big game about getting good trade deals. I mean, but at the end of the day, I mean, he, this is closing the, the barn door after the horse is out. You know, the U.S. still is a major manufacturing power. It's just that U.S. manufacturers are very efficient and there aren't the same number of manufacturing jobs available. So in some ways, Pre uh, Secretary Clinton's approach is much better in that she's thinking about how do we create jobs in the economy as a whole. And frankly, we haven't heard any of that from Donald Trump at all. We didn't hear it last night. I mean, he talks about these bad trade deals, but there's no plan for how do you actually create good jobs in the United States. It's just a question of, well, I'm going to stop jobs from going overseas in the first place. That's not good enough. Tobias Harris, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much indeed joining us there from Washington. Now, scientists in the United States say the first baby has been born using a new three-person fertility technique. The New Scientist Journal says a baby boy, who's now five months old, was born to Jordanian parents. The technique uses DNA from three people and could allow parents with rare genetic mutations to avoid passing them on to their babies. Our medical correspondent, uh, Fergus Walsh, is with me. And uh, Fergus, so this technique specifically to avoid the passing on of some kind of genetic mutation from the mother in this case? Absolutely. So, so in every case here, this is a genetic mutation uh, which is passed on down through the mother's egg in structures known as the mitochondria. They're the power packs of cells. And the couple from Jordan had already had two children who died of a genetic disorder and four miscarriages all as a result of faulty mitochondria. So, experts in New York uh, took healthy donor DNA from a second woman and then mixed it with the DNA, the key DNA, the, the DNA that you inherit from your parents that affects your personality, how you look, all the key DNA, and produced this healthy, apparently healthy, baby boy who's now five months old, but that tiny bit, that 0.01% of DNA from the, the third person, the healthy donor, will be passed on down the generations. Um, a little bit of disquiet that we haven't had the full scientific report on this. We're having to take their word on it. They're, it's come out as an abstract, one of these short, brief paragraphs that's, that hasn't even been yet discussed at the scientific conference. Um, but we will get that at some point. What is the ethical and legal position of a technique like this, radical technique? Well, it's very interesting. A lot of people are uncomfortable about it. Interesting that this team, based in New York, just off Central Park, um, went to Mexico to do this. They went to Mexico because there are no rules there. Indeed, many countries would make this unlawful. And interestingly, the only country that has actually specifically passed legislation to permit it is the United Kingdom. And a team of scientists in, in the north of England are planning to help a handful of women every year. But they haven't even applied for their license yet. Uh, the team, it's not a race, but the team in New York have done it first. Fergus, thanks very much. Fergus Walsh. A look at some of the day's other news stories now. Typhoon Meggie's made landfall in Taiwan. Third major storm to hit the island in a matter of weeks. Meggie's brought winds of nearly 200 kilometers an hour and has caused disruption across the island. At least four people have been killed, hundreds injured. Schools and offices are expected to be shut for a second day on Wednesday. 
New York authorities say a firefighter has died after responding to a report of a gas leak at a house in the Bronx. It seems an explosion happened at the two-storey home after firefighters discovered a drug lab there. Six other officers have been taken to hospital with minor injuries. A trial's begun in France of 15 current and former employees of Air France after two company executives had their shirts torn off as a meeting of jobs, job cuts descended into chaos. Five of them face charges of organised violence, while the rest are accused of damaging property. The violent protest took place last October at the airline's headquarters outside Paris. An Islamist militant from Mali who destroyed historic shrines in the city of Timbuktu has been sentenced to nine years in prison at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Ahmed Al-Faki Al-Mahdi led the desecration of a number of ancient tombs four years ago. Anna Holligan reports. The fabled city of Timbuktu, once a centre of Islamic learning. According to tradition, the door of the Sidi Yahya Mosque was supposed to stay sealed until the end of time. In this footage played in court, you can see it being broken down by jihadists, an attempt to destroy the mystery, and with it, centuries of history. Ahmed Al-Faki Ahmadi was a member of the Al-Qaeda affiliate Ansar Din. He was found guilty of running the Morality Brigade, a religious vice squad carrying out orders from the Sharia courts. They considered these Sufi shrines to be un-Islamic. At the start of the trial, the prosecutor explained why the destruction of cultural heritage is being prosecuted as a war crime for the first time. Deliberate attacks on cultural property have become actual weapons of war. They are being used to eliminate entire communities and wipe out the traces left of them, as though they never existed. During the trial, all visible signs of the militant jihadist had been deliberately erased, and he apologised. I am pinning my hope on the fact that the punishment that will be meted out to me will be sufficient enough for the people of Tambuktu to show forgiveness. People were also targeted during the rebel occupation and many of the victims say that this case fails to cover some of the most devastating crimes. Particularly crimes against women, uh, sexual violence, sexual slavery, rape, forced marriage. And the fact that these charges have not yet been represented at the ICC is very difficult for people to understand. The trial is being seen as a rare success for this controversial court. It proves that some African nations are willing to cooperate with the ICC. Amati is unlikely to appeal, which means the authorities now have access to someone who may have inside knowledge of Al-Qaeda. And it proves that people can be prosecuted for cultural crimes. Timbuktu has now been renovated, and for many local people, this represents a tangible and symbolic victory against the jihadists. Anna Holligan, BBC News, The Hague. Reports from Aleppo say that Syrian government forces have been making advances on the ground in the centre of the divided city. Military sources and rebels say pro-government forces appear to be mobilising for a possible ground assault after several days of heavy airstrikes against the rebel-held east of Aleppo. The new offensive was launched with Russian backing after a week-long ceasefire collapsed. Europe's migrant crisis shows no signs of easing. A ship which capsized off the northern coast of Egypt last week with hundreds on board has been raised from the seabed. Eleven more bodies were found on deck, bringing the total number recovered so far to 179. It's unclear how many more people may be found below deck. Many of the dead were young Egyptian men. What's driving so many of them to risk the journey to Europe? From northern Egypt, Ola Girin reports. The sons of Abu Kashaba are coming back home. This village and others nearby have buried 20 men and teenage boys. They fled the poverty of Egypt's Nile Delta, only to perish at sea. She grieves for her brother, Rada Abu Hamid, who boarded the migrant ship, though he was just 14. 
The women tell us people smugglers should be executed. Instead, they pay bribes and get released. Rada's grandmother says he wanted to help her get electricity and running water. She's been waiting 20 years. Shahid Rida. Mohammed Shalan. Moussad Ahmed says his friends needed jobs and paid with their lives. He was supposed to go with 30 others, but stayed behind because his aunt was ill. Among everybody here, if you are considering taking the boat, raise your hands. <laughs> Even 11-year-old Ayman wants to leave. Plenty of Egyptian children already have, many of them unaccompanied. But here's how the perilous journey across the Mediterranean to Italy can come to an end. A boat arrives with belongings of the victims. Some of them phoned home as they struggled to survive in the water. Relatives told us in the crucial early hours they got no help from the army base here. All in the, in the sea from 5 o'clock in the morning until 11. I come ask the captain here, he said another captain is sleeping. He's sleeping until 11 o'clock. We, we talk, we call phone, we, nobody answered us here. Allah lost his brother Haitham, who was 20. He gave him some money for the trip. A survivor brought it back. I asked him, you find my brother, you see my brother, he's swimming, he said, he swim like one hour. And he gave it to me your money and said, see, hi to Allah, goodbye, I can't see you again. Maybe I can't find my brother again. Locals say the lack of opportunities on shore will keep driving young men out to sea. They expect this tragedy to be repeated. Orla Giran, BBC News, Berg Rashid, Northern Egypt. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has taken new pictures of Europa, one of Jupiter's moons. They show jets of water spurting from the moon's icy surface. The images are the first direct evidence of a vast ocean under the ice, and the discovery increases the possibility of discovering life on Europa. Here's our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. More than 350 million miles away, orbiting Jupiter, is a tiny, intriguing world. Scientists think that under its surface there might be a vast ocean and where there's water there might be life. These new pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope are the first direct evidence of an ocean under Europa. At the bottom left jets of water, the largest of which is a hundred miles high. We've discovered these features here which may be plumes of water emerging from that ocean. If that's the case, it's exciting because it's depositing material from the ocean on the surface of Europa and into space. And that means we can look for organics and even signs of life. NASA and the European Space Agency both plan separate missions to the Moon in 2022. The discovery of these jets now means that the search for life on Europa is now much easier. Instead of having to land and drill through metres of ice to see what's in the ocean, spacecraft can now fly through the jets, collect the water and analyse it for evidence of alien life forms. I'm almost sure there is life of some kind out in our solar system. I'd be flabbergasted if there wasn't. I think the conditions seem to be right in a number of places. Um, that I'm almost certain bacteria of some kind must be able to form in the liquid water oceans at some of the moons of Jupiter and of Saturn as well. There's a new space race between the European Space Agency and NASA to get to Europa and the other moons of Jupiter. Whoever gets there first could answer one of the biggest questions in science. Are we alone in the universe? Palab Ghosh, BBC News. More on our website on that story and more you can get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm at Karin BBC. That's it from the programme. The weather's coming next. For now, for me, Karin Ginoni and the rest of the team, goodbye. <laughs>